Welcome along to another edition, uh, another Texas edition of Kicking It. And, and we have a USA legend in the building this time, former US Men national team goalkeeper, Tony Mueller. It's so good to have you with us. You're the first like OG yeah. that we have yeah. had on the show. So <laughs> It's a very old introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Original gangster. <laughs> but it's very uh, cool to have you with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I'm, I will say I'm a little nervous. I was nervous since you got, I've watched it. I've watched every episode. Um, just incredible and stuff. And what makes you nervous? What do you think we're gonna ask you? I don't know, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, the truth is, I, I just hate talking about myself, man. Like, I just, I don't work on the radio or TV. I make it a point to try and never talk about myself or, or sound like that person who, like, never made a mistake or did it all, you know, that kind of uh, analysis. And I... I is, is that a humility thing, because I don't want to be center of attention, or is it, like, a privacy thing, like, hey, you, you all don't need to know no, my I business? No, I think it's a humility thing, I, because I think, like, I, <laughs> I look at it like, like, if you care about me, like, you can go on the Internet and find some information out or, you know, something or go watch a game. I've never, I've never sat there and watched the game. I came home, I'm gonna Wait, say about- with your kids or something? I came home, I was gonna tell you, I came home about five years ago. My kids were sat on the couch and they were watching uh, a documentary about the two Escobars, you know? Yeah. And, and the game video came up and, and I, I, I will say I sat down because of the story, but I was uncomfortable when the game video came up. Like, I, I don't know why, I just don't, I know, I feel like I just wanna, I'm, I'm always going like the next step and I'm never really looking back and, and maybe one day I will. Um, I, I did, we just moved, this was the coolest thing. I, I, not moving, the moving's not the coolest thing. It's about the worst <laughs> thing in the world. Right? Packing but, up boxes, but, I'm back. But I was, I, I had this bin that had all the jerseys that I collected and I have pictures other on my- Other players' jerseys. Other players' oh, jerseys and I started going through them. That was the first time I ever like relived like, this is when we were in Italy in the World Cup. And I'm thinking to myself as I'm like, grabbing these jerseys and throwing, I'm like, man, someone would probably love to have every one of these here and I'm taking it for granted that I have these things. What's but, the yeah. best one you got? Um, well, I think my first World Cup jersey, um, even though we got our asses kicked against Czechoslovakia, you, you know, your first World Cup game is kind of hard to forget. Mm -hmm. And for me, Growing up as an Italian-American kid, if I could think of two places in the world that I would want to play a World Cup, I played 1990 in Italy, and then the following World Cup was in the U.S. Right. Right, so I couldn't have, like, it was like we warmed as up. As an Italian-American. Right, like we warmed up a little bit in Italy, you know, we kind of, it was the first team and, and you know, that made it in 40 years, so that was our, our warm-up, our appetizer, and then we got to the World Cup. My parents were born in Italy. They didn't come here. I'm first generation. I grew up speaking Italian when I was a kid. I didn't speak English until I was five or six years old. And here I am in Rome playing Italy. Uh, and I'm like, holy shit, like, how does this? <laughs> and so my, the, the, the story behind it, we still don't know who from, uh, my father was rooting for. He hasn't ever really <laughs> said, <laughs> right, who he was rooting for. My mother clearly was rooting for us. But my grandmother was in the stadium before she passed away and she was almost blind. And I have this picture that was a picture that was taken by like, like FIFA, like by the World Cup committee, not a picture that my family took, you but here's my picture. grandmother. You can see in the picture, my family, and my grandmother was, she had her hands up. So I was asking my dad, I said, you know, what was, what was Nona, we call her Nona, what was Nona doing? And my mom's like, she was, feel, she was trying to feel you in the game, because she couldn't see. She was loser. So here's this picture that I'm flipping through a FIFA book, and I'm like, holy shit, that's my family, you know? And then my grandmother's like on the side, and she's like doing this, and she's trying to feel the game. So, like, wow. that that's experience, crazy. like, like that wasn't planned. That just kind of happened, you know? So it's so, so cool. But I was going through those jerseys, and that was kind of the first time that I ever, like, rewound mm. a little bit um, because I. Enjoyed the nostalgia. Yeah, I did a little bit. Yeah. Um, Tony said, first World Cup game you never you never forget. What was yours? Um, mine was against Italy, actually. The year that they won the World Cup in 2006, it was the second game. Did you score that game? No, Beasley scored, oh. but it was called back. But uh, that was my first start in a World Cup representing my country. So, you know, going against Toti and other players like that, and I mean. That was, it was a real special moment, but my favorite moment is the first goal in the World Cup, which came against Ghana. Also the first game versus Czech Republic when 
they beat us 3 nothing, and thinking, damn, this is another World Cup that's going to go by that I'm not really going to play because I played in a U-20 World Cup um, in UAE, and I hardly played at all. So that's kind of was my thoughts after that first game, like, damn, bro, it's another World Cup. It's going to come and go, and I ain't going to really do shit. And then got the chance to play against Italy uh, in that game, and we tied them, and, you know, they ended up winning the World Cup, so. That's yeah. cool. Uh, I would say the best jersey I, I kept for myself was scoring against Mexico in Azteca Stadium. I had always dreamed of playing in that game. And so after the match, I don't think you're you even supposed to trade with Mexico. Like, I've never seen someone swap jerseys like an with a Mexican role. player. Yeah, I feel like you just, you don't do it. So I was making sure that I could keep my, my kit and I snuck it in my bag and took it home. <laughs> Who did you trade with? I didn't trade with anyone. Oh, you kept I kept jersey. my own You wanted that shirt. Kind of, do you frame, did you frame it? Do you frame your shirts? Yeah. You mm -hmm. do? I think you'll, you'll frame yours. Are you going to embrace kind of like reminiscing I, a little more? I have more? a couple framed. I have that Zenga one framed that's not hanging up uh, in my office now. When I get on Zoom and when we do our radio show, I've got my first World Cup jersey on one side. Uh, behind me, it's hard to see because it's behind me, but I have the, the 2002 team behind me because I, I still think that that um, is one of the best uh, teams we've had, you know, when you talk about different cycles. And then above me to my right shoulder is my high school jersey. Oh, it's wow. my high school oh, cool. soccer jersey. Yeah. Did you have the 2002 one surprises me? Because that you weren't like a star on that team, yeah. right? Whereas in, in 1990, 1994, yeah. yes, you were. I'll tell you why. Because I played in 90 and 94, and Steve Sampson left me off the 1998 team. Uh -huh. um, and I had to fight to get, I had to fight the most to get to the 2002 team. What was the um, excuse that was given to you for being cut? So Steve Sampson told me um, that he wanted bigger goalkeepers. Yeah, so I was the smallest of the the, the crew. Um, that was a. That How was tall a, are you, Tony? Six one. Um, I mean, were you significantly smaller I mean, than the other guy? Looking like a linebacker, I'd be scared no, to, but, to, but, to go up for a header against. But him, I could sure. I could jump through the roof and. Did you feel like it was a truthful reason? Yeah, it was a weird cycle. So that was 1998. In 1997, um, I believe it was, it was January camp in Orlando. I was out of the national team picture, but I was killing it in MLS. I really was, was playing probably the best that I've played. And I get a phone call. Um, I'll never forget it. I get a phone call, and I'm with my dad in this, this house that we had just moved in in Montclair, New Jersey. And we were ripping floors up in my house, literally ripping up the floors. And the phone call I get from uh, Steve, and he says, hey, are you going to be in California anytime soon? I said, matter of fact, I do my preseason training all the time in Redondo Beach. Um, Jerry Rice used to go run up the hill, and we used to go with the NFL guys and do that little, uh, that little valley run, you know? And we made an arrangement to meet uh, somewhere near his house, and, and I, I went there. and. Um, I got there and he sat down and the first thing he said to me is, I'm going to bring you into national team camp. I said, oh, you know, I was thrilled, you know, you're going national team. I hadn't been there for two years. I, I left the national team uh, in 94 just to deal with some family. You've never really talked about why you left. It's all good, bro. Take your time. Yeah. So, you know, two years was. Can I ask you a question? Is the tears because because that time was so hard because stepping away from the team was so hard? Like uh, stepping away was easy. You know, it's your family, right? You I mean, this is a freaking game, you know? Yeah, the, t the time was hard. It's, it's still hard, actually. So the game was, the game was all, I, you know, you guys know when, when stuff happens, 
Yeah, it's like two hours of freedom, you know? Yeah. You go there, you're like, oh, Therapy. God, just get away from everything for a minute. You know, just two hours, just like, you're, you're almost like, just leave me, I'll do anything for two hours, you know? Just leave me alone, just, just like, get everything out of your head. And that's, that's where I was. So I, got, I go to this meeting with Steve and I always thought I had a good relationship with him. And he says, hey, I'm gonna bring you into the national team. And I was thrilled because, you know, I, had, I was basically beating myself up because of life that was going on around me. And he says to me, he looks at me and he goes, but there's gonna be one thing, you're gonna show me respect. And I, and I was like kind of thrown back. And you never felt there had been disrespect. Never, so. never. And I kind of started to sense like this is this isn't Steve. Like this is the Federation. Like I I, I sensed like this is U.S. soccer. It's not really Steve because I don't see Steve that way. So I, I go okay. Well, you know, when you want to go to the national team, you do whatever. Our coach says, uh, you know, go jump off of, you know the mountain. You go jump yeah. right because you want to go to the national team. You do anything. So we get to camp and we go through camp and camp goes great. We get to the game and. A soccer official, come, I won't tell you who it was ever, I never, wa I never will, um, comes up to me and said, literally, like on my shoulder, says, I swore you'd never wear this jersey again. <laughs> Damn. I'm like, holy shit, man. So they really held it against you that you yeah. decided to take a time out. Yeah. It, it, That's got to, seeing how painful whatever it is was for you in that period of time, that has to hurt that you feel like, hey, man, I, I, I gave everything to be part of this team. I, I just needed a minute for me personally. And, and I, I always thought, because 94 was the first World Cup I, I got to watch as a kid, and you were like this big goalkeeper that, you know, was almost like Captain America. You were always, and after that World Cup, it was like, I know there wasn't MLS, so you're trying to figure out what... Well, there what, was supposed to be, right? The, right. The, the following year, but yeah. then it happened two years. Remember, they, we were supposed to start in 95, right? In, in, I guess, February of 95, which would have been, what, like seven months later? But then in December, they decided to push it back one year, and that's where I got stuck, right there. That was... That, so it, it's like, where, you know, what are you doing? And then it was like, oh, you're, you're going to kick for the Jets, or you're going to act. And I was like, oh, you're doing kind of like a Michael Jordan thing where it's like, I'm, I'm good with soccer. Well, <laughs> a couple things. One, you had to make a living, right, to right. do something. But that, that wasn't necessarily it because I was fortunate in 94. I mean, I had, I had two, two offers that were written on the table. The first one was from Botafogo. I always wanted to go to South America. It was mm, in Brazil. And the, and the other one was from Southampton. And I was convinced I was going to Southampton, but, but in my brain, I was like, I just lived in California for 18 months. I got to deal with this stuff at home. And I'm like, I can't go to Southampton. <laughs> you know, like I can't now move a, a, an ocean away, right, to go. And that's kind of when everything started. So, but my, my thought was, okay, here's, here's this seventh month period that I got to kind of manage, right? Just to get to February of 1995 or March, whenever we were going to start. Um, and then they, like the rug was pulled out. I don't know if you guys remember Roger Twibel. He said to me, have you ever thought about kicking in the NFL? He, he, was, not, he was not a big soccer fan, but he saw me kick you know, a soccer ball. He's like, you ever thought about kicking the And I'm like, yeah, it was always a dream of mine to kick in the NFL. I literally said it like that. And then when I was done with the, with the World Cup and we were uh, a, a month later, um, I get this call that, they, like, Pete Carroll wants me to go try out for the Jets. Pete Carroll was the coach. I'm like, man, Pete Carroll, holy, you know, you know Pete Carroll, you know? And I'm like, cool, I'll go. And I thought it was going to be like a, I thought it was going to be like a, 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 a stunt like they were going to do, you know? I didn't know I was going there. So anyway, for two days, I go to high school with my best friend, Sal, and we're kicking footballs, and I'm like, I don't, I have nothing, I don't know if it's good, if it's bad, I have no, no yeah. parameter, you know, nothing, <laughs> like, uh, it, I'm just kicking the ball. So I go there, and the media guy meets my agent and I at the front door, he goes, we just signed Ronnie Lott to the team, and if you remember Ronnie yeah. Lott, we just signed, we have Boomer in here, he goes, we've never seen so much media here. There's oh, media wow. from all over the world. <laughs> 
He's like, I'm like, whoa, whoa, no one told me about this, oh, <laughs> right? Damn. So I go out, they give me like a jersey and a uniform. That's the one that's on the football card that, that is out. And here I am in front of all these guys kicking a football. So I kick, I do what I did, and, and I go inside, and they're like, we'd like to sign you. Literally like that. This whole thing, from the time I pulled up to the front door of the building to the time that I got into the GM's office, was probably 45 minutes total. And they're like, we want to sign you. So they, they cut a check. It was $29,000. They cut a, a signing bonus check for, for that. And I'm like, well, I got to tell my wife. I got to like, do something, right? I got to call my parents or something. It's just me and my agent like, and all these people. I have no, if it was soccer, like, you knew everybody in the room. I knew nobody. So anyway, I was like, OK, well, this thing doesn't start until, MLS doesn't start until February, so. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I said I, I didn't want to be the guy, Kate, that said, like, when I'm, I'm 55 now. That looks back. Yeah, looks back and goes, God damn, I should have went to kick uh -huh. when I had the chance. You know, <laughs> like, that's not me. You know, it's never been me. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I was there for, I guess, 11 weeks of the season. And then right after that, I thought I was going to MLS a couple months later, and that gets pulled out. So I played with the Long Island Rough Riders. We had a great team. It was at the time was the highest division we had in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I had to bridge the gap somehow, um, and that's how I bridged it. Playing in that team with Alfonso Mondello, who was our coach. Um, man, it was it was so such a great time. And then MLS started, and we rolled, man. Did you do you have to provide for your family at all during that stretch? No, I was lucky during the World Cup. Federation paid us for the time that we were in Mission Viejo which mm -hmm. was an 18-month period. Right. And we, we were in tears. They actually brought us in in tears in meetings. So they, they tiered, like, the top four players, you were going to make this. And the next four players, you, and they brought you in a room, and they're like... And everybody knew. And like, us That's four go in the, Us four go in the room, and, and Sunil Gulati said, you guys are our top tier. This is what you're going to make, you know, basically. And, and Bill Nuttall was the general manager back then, and that's how it went. Oh, and wow. They, that's wild. They, 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 they tiered you. That wasn't, um, that wasn't like that with us. Everybody made the exact same. Well, that was the bonuses, right? No, that was, that was everything. Oh. I, mean, bon I mean, bonuses would be a little bit different yeah. in terms of World Cup qualifying. If you played more games than another person, well, then you made a little bit more money. But normally, when you right. just played in a game, whoever was in the 18, y'all all got paid the yeah, same. Yeah, we did that with the bonuses, although okay. ours weren't nearly as much back then. Our, our bonuses to win, um, I think if we won, I'm, I'm going to guess, you're going to laugh, if we won a World Cup qualifier, I think we made 350 bucks in bonuses. Dang. What, what would a top tier play, I mean, if you're comfortable saying, what would they have been making? It was six figures. Yeah, they were paying you six figures back then. I think all of them, I think everybody was that mm -hmm. went to Mission Viejo. Okay. Um, one of the uh, advantages, like if you were married, you had an extra room in your apartment. Uh -huh. Yeah, in case you had family come over. So I was living in a two bedroom. <laughs> yeah. I had the two bedroom. That's crazy. And then we didn't have roommates. That's crazy. Our per diem was more than that. Oh, I know. Oh, when what? I was, wow. In 2002, Your per I mean, diem was more than $350? Yeah, in 2002, it was like that, too. And I was thinking all the time, I'm like, oh, we're making more per diem to wash our clothes than we made to win a World Cup qualifier in 1989, you know? Hey, that's a high per diem, isn't it? I mean, no? I guess they feel like whatever meals they're not providing during the day, like, you get paid. Right. It, yeah. That's why you're always asking CBS for that per diem, hey, huh? Hey, if you don't make money, don't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask a question and not wanting to dig into something sensitive, but the U.S. Federation, you feeling like they held that against you? That's one thing, right? Because they're not your people necessarily, right? But I had read some of the comments of, like, teammates, people I assume that you had kind of, like, a closeness to who expressed an opinion on you acting or expressed an opinion on you going off to the NFL. Did, did you did you feel supported by your teammates during that period of time? Yeah, I never I never felt anything. I mean, they always I mean, everyone always asked this, especially about the NFL thing because I think there's always um, I don't know this inherent bug to know if you can do it, like yeah. if you can kick a football. I yeah. don't know if you guys ever felt like that, like hey, I think I could do that, you know? Yeah, I, th I think with anything, shit, going out there shooting a basketball, seeing if you can make threes. Right. I mean, whatever. It, even if it was like a tennis racket, being an athlete, a competitor, you're like, well, shit, let's see if I see what you can do. So, right. but I think it's crazy that at the highest level, to put yourself in that situation to do it, like, I commend you, man. It takes a lot of guts to kind of like. You didn't know what you were getting into, but once 
you know, you made the team. You're like, all right, fuck it. Let's see, let's see how this goes, man. So, yeah. did, and you, did, did they have more acceptance because they knew what you were dealing with personally, or you locked down on no, that? No, they had no idea what I was dealing with. So nobody really knows what you were dealing with. No. Nor will they. <laughs> So to go back to post-1994 World Cup, and you're dealing with a lot of things, you overcome it, right? Because you eventually go on to have, you know, a career season uh, for Kansas City when you have 16 shutouts in the season. Yeah. Wouldn't you say that's your MLS, best season? Weren't you MLS MVP as a goalie? I was, yeah. Which is, that's rare. That's yeah, rare to be It's going to be, be hard to do now. Um, it's going to be hard for someone to do that now. Why? Uh, obviously, more teams. We have more foreign players in the league that are bigger names, and I think sometimes it becomes a popularity contest yeah. when you vote, right? Oh, okay. It, so I'm, I'm, I'm not discrediting anyone that's ever won it before. I just think, like, you know, you, you have fans involved, you have media involved, and you have player. I always looked at the... I, every year I look at the player votes, which counts for one-third of the votes. That's why I think it's going to be hard to do again. Yeah. You know, really, I mean, really difficult. Yeah. I mean, 16 shutouts is crazy. Yeah, we were good that year. We, we, we took pride in, in defending, but we're also the third highest scoring team in the league, um, which people seem to forget for whatever reason, because we, we, there were a bunch of big games where we won 1 0. Did you win the league that year? We and and we, Supporter Shield? We won everything. We That's won crazy. We were in first place from man, start you, to finish. Man, that you took year. home a lot that year. Yeah. I, but that team gets overlooked whenever. Anyone's talking about greatest MLS teams. No one ever seems to bring up that Kansas City side. Why, why do you think That's right, that? man. I got the ring. <laughs> 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 I remind myself all the time, though. It's, um, yeah, it was a good team. I mean, we were, we were stacked, man, with that group. When was the crossover? Like, because you've played against each other. Charlie, I, have you played against Tony or no? No. no. But you we, have played. Yeah, we played against each other 2004. Four and 2005? Two years, yeah. I remember. So I, you were where at the time? Uh, I was in uh, one year in Kansas City and then one year in uh, uh, started the season as the Metro Stars and through preseason became the Red Bulls. Okay. Was the, yeah, so. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. You enjoy scoring past him? Yeah, I mean, it's always good to, you know, so you <laughs> score against a legend, yeah. you know what I mean? So, like... Did you score on me? Yeah, man, check the tape. Where's the tape? <laughs> I'm sure you're going to roll it somewhere. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it was anytime you could go against, uh, you know, the people that inspired you, like, that 94 World Cup, I remember going and watching games uh, in Dallas um, and, and watching y'all on TV and just seeing, you know, that run and, and getting out of that group. What was, what was that like? Because the U.S. is going to experience that. Playing a World Cup in your own country and, you know, the challenge that you had in front of you and the expectations that were on your shoulders. Well, the experience was incredible because I don't, I don't know that the players now will feel so much shock at the World Cup when they see filled stadiums and, mm. you know, all, this whole buildup going to the World Cup because I, I think they're... The players now are a little bit more programmed based on what happens at their clubs. And we got guys playing, you guys played in big clubs. You know, so you, you have, we didn't have that buildup. Like we didn't have that. It wasn't until like two months before the World Cup that we even, not we, but the general public knew that the World Cup was coming to the US. Mm. I mean, really coming. We knew it was gonna be here, but no one really, there was a, this whole, half the country had no idea really what the World Cup was, right? And. I don't know that that's going to be the case in 2026. I think we're so much more prepared now. They're... With that pressure, you know what I mean? Know that like you have a, a World Cup at home. You don't know if you're going to ever get that opportunity again. They're going to have that same pressure on, on, on their shoulders. And then also the pressure of like ha to do well to start a professional league. It's even more. No team had ever, no host country had ever not made it to the next round. Oh, wow. <laughs> right? So, hell, if we wanted to be the first ones, right, to, to do it, I, I give that group so much credit because it will never happen again. The, you had two jobs when you played on the national team, Those, that group that was living in Mission Viejo. You were a player from 9 o'clock until whatever, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, whenever you left and you were promoting the game 24 hours a day. Mm. We did everything. 
every every talk show, every school book reading, like you from yeah. top to yeah. bottom, we we did it because we had to. Every time we went to a city, pretty much the first day in that city, you train, and it was dedicated to scattering 25 guys around the city to promote the game. Like, are, you, are you glad that you played in that generation? Or if you could if you could swap it, you would take this generation? No, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I really wouldn't. Despite the money, despite the I, accessibility I to it. Europe, all of that? No, I would, I would keep it just the way it is. That group of players, and we we did the billion dollar goal documentary. That yeah. group of that that group um, and that '94 group are so special to this game. I hope that people realize it. Mm. Um, I'm lucky enough to have lived it with them, so I know firsthand how special they were, how much they cared about the game, um, and how much they they cared to do something that our national team had never done before. Mm. So I, I wouldn't take any of that back. Do you think your generation had an understanding of what they had sacrificed to pave that way for you, or do you uh, think it wasn't kind of? I, I don't. I don't think I had an idea of that. Um, as much as what y'all sacrificed and how hard you had to promote it, um, and you talk about those interviews, I was, you know, even during my time, I was kind of like the current players. I would say, you know, you just focus on playing. You were tired. You didn't want to do something unless it was, you know, absolutely needed to do it. Um, it wasn't like you just take on everything that you could do because you wanted to have that energy to still be able to perform. And for y'all to be doing, running, and doing everything, and then still having that energy to play at a top level and, and get out of that group and deal with all that kind of pressure um, is, is crazy. I mean, I, I, I have an appreciation for what y'all did because y'all allowed me to like realize a dream. Because growing up, it was always, the biggest thing you could do was play for your country. That's all, I that's all I prayed about, that's all I dreamed about as a kid. I want to represent my country and to score, a goal, to score a goal in the World Cup. But after 94, you had that thought, man, I might can play professional soccer and be able to take care of my family in, in some type of way and be a kid for a longer period of time. Uh. So that wasn't even a hope for me as a kid that there would be a professional soccer until- Oh, this is interesting to me. Until after that, it was, the only dream was, can you play for your country and, and, pl and play in a World Cup? Mm. Yeah, it was a different time. Um, so my, my point is, like, I, I think about why I wouldn't change. I think about how special that group was. Um, that 90 team that we did the documentary about, forget, I was lucky. I mean, I was in college at the time. I had really had no worry because it was still part of the path. Some of those guys had already started making their way in like the business world. Mm. And then they'd get called in for a World Cup qualifier, you know, and, and they were training at night on fields with college teams or youth teams and because there was nowhere to play. And if you think about that now, it like it makes no sense, right? It doesn't that would never happen again anywhere. Mm. Um, it wasn't like you could have like, you know, training centers that just to go lift like lift weights and do speed and, like that didn't exist. I think it that, reminds that. me how young the game is here in, in terms of like, like just uh, that's astounding to me that that's really not all that long ago. But, but you know what else is crazy by listening to the story and knowing more about what's going on because uh, there's only so much that I knew. But how much y'all did to like grow the game and like perform, get out of the group and them not having a professional league in place and then you come in back and, you know, them feeling a certain type of way after everything that you did to grow it to where it was, that it's like, you'll never, I never thought I'd see you play for this federation again. Like, how were you able to, like, take that on the chin yeah. and be like, you know what, this is fucked well, up, bro. Right. Because I, because I love the game, you know, and, and that's how I framed it in my head, man. I love the game. I just love, I told you, I love talking about the game and analyzing it and, and, you know, that's why th this, like all this stuff is so uncomfortable to me because I, I just, this isn't really my love. Like I love our game like the, the, and I love seeing it grow. And I, I feel like I'm one of the few guys that are currently in the game mm. that know it from the start, mm. right? Yeah. Like, if you, like I know 
I, I know what happened in 86. I know when we lost to Costa Rica and I was sitting in front of the TV. I don't know if you guys know that what happened and... I was born in 86, so... But I'm yeah. saying... No, do you understand my point? Yeah. Like, I know it and I'm like, that was the first moment for me where I said, I'm gonna go to a World Cup. Like, how stupid was that? I was 17 years old. Like, it's the dumbest thing you could say, but I'm gonna go to the World Cup, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I knew that... I, I heard them say, the U.S. doesn't qualify for the World Cup once again. You know, I'm like... Yeah. No, no, we'll get there. You know, yeah. like, it's a stupid thing to say when you're a kid, but it's a dream, right? Yeah, and that's what I felt. Not that I felt it to the extreme that you felt it, but I always felt like, you know what? Every time that I represented the U.S. and 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 played against other teams, I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna show these motherfuckers what's up. I'm gonna show them that we know how to play. We're not just like can kick and run. We got skill. We right. can take people on. And it pissed me off that that we were looked at like, uh, you know yeah, what I'm sure. saying? Especially with my Latin friends growing up. I felt a certain way, like, I'm gonna show you motherfuckers, dude, that the, 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 you know, yeah. the, these Americans can play. And it's kind of like that chip on your shoulder that like, I've always felt when I've represented the national team. Yeah. When, when, when you, cause you loved the game so much, when you knew it was coming to the end for retirement, did you want to step away? Or did you want to like get right back into you know, being a coach, being just, in the locker room. Just for the record, I never, I never officially retired, so I'm still, I'm still <laughs> available. <laughs> Get one of those US Open Cup yeah. games. <laughs> no, I'm done. I'm done. Um, but uh, yeah, so I stepped away for two years, man, uh, because of the way I got, the way I was released. I mean, I was released in an email from Bruce Arena. You know, I was released, and I sat, and went to his office, and I said, "Man, I've been here every day. I didn't play at the end of the year." You sent me an email like three weeks ago saying how you've been such a great soldier. I know you're not playing. I know it must be tough at the end of your career, but I made a decision to go with another goalkeeper. You've been such a great teammate to everybody. I said, you could have told me that like to, to my, my face, face yeah. you know, like, and and then I get, I get released via email and I said, you know, I've known you forever. And I didn't talk to Bruce for, I didn't care to talk to Bruce for like three or four years. Now we're good. Like we're like I talk to him like nothing happened. Yeah. You're a better man than me. I couldn't go up to somebody and just talk like nothing happened. Well, here's Clint. You know, I, same. But I respect it. You know no, what I'm saying? Here, I'm not saying. Here's the thing. I, I get what you're saying, but we got to work in this game together. Yeah. Like I don't think we're in a position to not work together in our country. Mm. I don't think we're. we're I, I don't think. There's so much fighting in our country. There is a lot of division. I yeah. agree with that. Within especially, soccer. Yeah, especially the club system, everything. Mm -hmm. You're not having the best teams always playing each other. You're not having to play your way into the best league. You're just in the league, you know? Like, How about like, even you, you have to get accepted to be in leagues? Like, if you created a club, you got your club team. Yeah. Some clubs, uh, they, leagues, they will can, say, they no, can, you're not. They keep you from joining you that. You can't join our league. And you're like, what? Why can't yeah. we all it's be... Just, it's just too much, man. It really is. And, and I don't know that there's a solution, but I wasn't going to be... I guess my, my, my point is I wasn't going to be part of the problem. Mm. We can do more good together than we can do being divided, going in different ways. Feel like you're at peace though. Like it feels like you had to bottle a lot of stuff inside, and Man, you feel like Clint. I am so at peace right now with that's good. because I, I told you I don't like talking about my myself, but if you want to talk about my kids yeah. and seeing their they them have success and going to watch games and and your boy at Oklahoma yeah, balling right. out. Oh, it's you. Not oh, it's you. Oklahoma, my bad. Not Oklahoma. My yeah, bad. It's a big difference. I got clothes. I'm clothes. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the right state. Um, Hitting home runs for fun. Yeah, I, that man, that that's that's for me. Like I'm the ultimate like fan, man, of my kids and and seeing them play. Uh, you know, it's been, I guess I'm on like ten years in a row of college sports. You know, between yeah. my three kids, mm -hmm. Jonathan played, my daughter Kylie, she's the only one who played soccer. Mm -hmm. uh, and now my son's playing baseball and it's... Uh, <laughs> How did, yeah. Can I ask a question? And this maybe sounds super stereotypical, right? But coming from Europe, that's why I asked the question. Like, I remember growing up, 
Um, my dad played football with his son, but he never played with me. That just wasn't even a thought to him. He did other sports with me. He took me to track and field and to whatever else. But just soccer, it was never a concept for mm -hmm. him. Let me play soccer with my daughter. I, I guess you coming from an Italian family and having that kind of European mindset, did you have to adjust to thinking about your daughter playing soccer, or was that always just a given to you? No, it was a given. Uh, in my, so I'd coached my oldest in, in multiple sports, and then it was kind of my daughter's turn, right? Mm -hmm. And my wife said to me, you need to spend some time coaching Kylie at some point. And I was like, Colleen, no way, man. I, I'm not doing it, you know? <laughs> I, I don't relate to these 11-year-old girls, right? I just don't <laughs> relate. I love my daughter to death. Like, uh -huh. I want to, you know, hug her 24 hours a day. But I don't know how to coach. Like, I'm scared, you know? Uh -huh. And... A year later, I, I did it. And I came back from the first training session, and my wife was like, how is it? I'm like, I'm doing my penance right now. That's what I'm <laughs> doing right now. It was the best five years of my life. Why? Coaching. How many hours my daughter and I spent in the car driving mm -hmm. to tournaments. There were times where I would take, you know, a couple of players, you know, her friends in the car. We'd drive to a tournament. I wouldn't say a word and just listen. And I, I guarantee you, I don't have a picture, but I guarantee you I was smiling, just driving the car, just listening. And now my daughter is 22 years old. She's in the workforce now. She loves the game. She loves, she'll sit down. If I'm watching the Champions League game, she'll sit down and ask me. She loves the game, right? And she and I are like this. It became one of the coolest parenting experiences I had. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was getting into. Okay, can you give us a perspective of being being the daughter in that situation? No, that's why that made me emotional. So I just lost my dad in um, oh, I'm December, sorry, Pete. and um, like the time I spent with him in sports was everything to me. So hearing how much that meant to you was like it was special because I think we all know like sports teaches you character, right? Like so much of what. It is, is special about sports is that it, it teaches you determination, commitment, you know, stick, durability, Resilience. the fact you have to stick with things. And so much of what I enjoy about, like, who my dad was, was, was the example that he was to me, the good character I saw in him, but also just, like, man, the fun we had in those, in those moments. And I, I remember, I, I'm divorced, I got married <laughs> a while ago. Um, mm. And when he gave the speech at my wedding, one of the things he said to me, you know, you'll, you'll look back at some point in your life and you'll never wish that you spent more time at work. What you will always value is family and those moments that you had. And yeah, it's just dope to hear what it means to another father. Oh, it's Because that bond is so special. Yeah, I think if, you, if my kids sat here today and you asked them, like, what's one lesson your dad gave you? I've told them that they have to promise me that they spend more time with their kids than I actually spent with them. That's what I need to do a better job of, especially with my oldest daughter. I, it's hard for me to go to the game and not have such high expectations that it's hard for her that, to put on her. I need to be more, just be there for her and, 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 and you know, support her a little bit better. And I'm, I'm glad that we were able to have this conversation because it puts things in a better perspective. And I think I lose that sometimes, but that, that's kind of how I feel with my oldest. I'm the toughest on her of all of them. Yeah. Sometimes, though, in life, I feel like your greatest strength is, can be your greatest weakness, yeah. right? And you're a winner. Yeah. That's who you are, and that's why you are who you were on the field. Yeah. But then, yeah, can that have a knock-on effect? And it can be hard it's to just allow someone else to just be in a space and, yeah. and not want them to win the way you wanted to. I'm sure that's hard. That's what I got to do. That's what I got to do. I got to grow up and, and get in that space and, and do a better job of, of making, that, making the time count more. When I left the game, you told, I left for two years, man. I was, I was out. I never thought I'd be in this sport again. I was out. I got so engulfed in my family and my kids. Like, that was joy. I couldn't, I didn't know how I was going to make a living. I thought I'd go and build houses. That's what I thought I'd do. I mean, because that's my whole family's in construction business and, you know, in, in, in the labor field. And I thought that's what I would do. Uh, and it would have been fine with me as long as I had enough time with, with my kids um, to spend and go to practices and all that stuff. And, and then this freaking media thing happened. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I got here 12 years later, but I'm here. Like, I'm... And, and I got to say, when I retired, I wasn't sure exactly what lane I was going to go down. But then I, I said, okay, media is interesting to me. And so 
you know, you're trying to do as much as you can. Reps, take reps, you know, radio if you can, TV. And so Sirius XM at Brian Dun Dunseth reached out to me and said, hey, would you be interested in, in filling in here and there? And then that's when I got to work with Tony for the first time. And you were so helpful, um, giving me advice, just making it easy for me to feel comfortable and, and tell me things that I should focus on. So, you know, I can't thank you enough. I always looked up to you and, and a lot of the guys that came before me, because I always, like you, you have respect because of the foundation you set for us. I, I knew that 94 team in particular. Now that I know Billion Dollar Goal, I, lo I know a lot more. But in 94, I thought, wow, this team is what allowed MLS to, to, to be born, right? And so, you know, I looked up to you guys, and then for you to help me on the opposite end, you know, further down the line was, was really special. So I can't thank you enough for, for making man, that. Man, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Yeah, that's our job, man. That's, that's, that's why I, when I tell you I don't want to hold a grudge, like that's our job is to push the ball down the hill, man, you know, and, and, and the snowball's got to get bigger somehow. And if we don't do it, you know, I feel like there's no one from the outside that's going to do it. I told you I was coaching and I was going to get to that. I spent five and a half years with the youth national teams. And I thought my relationship at U.S. soccer was great and Tab made it great for all of us. Brad Friedel was there. I mean, he was bringing guys in everywhere. And the kids really enjoyed it. I think there's something to be said for players who knew the weight it, it was to wear the jersey and also mm -hmm. could demonstrate what they were saying uh, in terms of the coaching. Because for me, when you can see that, you know, someone you know, played the game and, and can demonstrate what they're talking about, there's just a different level of respect than someone just saying, hey, you need to do this, and then, like, they can't even juggle the ball. And it's like, how are you going to tell me, like, how mm. to do something and, and you can't even demonstrate it? Right. So. But just to, to like, if I'm, if I'm, right now, if I'm 15 years old and Clint Dempsey walks in, mm -hmm. like, I, honestly, I'm not saying this because you're sitting here. I, I, the two best players for me that we've ever produced are Clint Dempsey and Tab Ramos. Those are them. I, I don't tell you because you're here, because I've said it 100 times on the radio. I don't need you to be here for, for me to tell you that. Like, Clint Dempsey walks in a room, and I'm 15 years old, and I'm an a, a, attacking player. I don't care how many. I'm a goalkeeper. I'm like, god damn, that's Clint Dempsey. Uh -huh. Like, Charlie Davies, like, because the way Tab did it, Tab would let, when he set the camp up, he'd let the players know who's going to be, who the coaches are going to be. So you know already parents are looking up this stuff and who the assistant coaches are. And then when he got there, like, he made an introduction. He had videos. It was so cool because I think it's so important for our youth national teams to have that. We mm -hmm. do have a history. It's not, it's not the deepest history. It's not like England. It's not like I get it, but we have a history. I didn't say that as a, as a diss, by the no, way. I, I just... didn't take it as that. Oh, okay. But, but we have to, but I think we forget our history sometimes, mm -hmm. even as short as it. We should know most of the history because it's not nearly as right. long as some of the others, right? So, yeah, I don't think we do a great job of that currently, and I hope that changes. Mm -hmm. no, I agree with that. Just in terms of, like, history of any club that you play for, whether it's MLS and they don't have a big history or, you know, with the national team, like, I didn't know that much about the billion-dollar goal other than the fact that, he scored the goal that got you know qualified for the World Cup, Caligiri. But I didn't know uh, everything else that kind of kind of went into that. So I think there is a lot that's that's kind of missed. And even you know the education of U.S. Open Cup. I didn't know about some of that when we talked about it. It was always like when I was playing in the U.S. Open Cup, and no disrespect, it was like, oh man, I, well, what are we doing this for? Like right. you know, I didn't respect it like I like I should have because. I didn't know the history about it. And I think that's because, to your point, you know, you don't really, you don't get that all the time. You're obviously so invested, right, in, in growing the game and in what soccer can still become in this country and the, the, the further progress it can make. 2026, how optimistic are you about what that changes for this country and, and, and what happens with the game? Kate, if it's half the springboard that 1994 was, if I had a nickel for every time someone said, 1994 is when I got turned on to the game, mm. right? Um, I'd be a rich man because that was such a special moment in our country in a time where we didn't know a lot about the game, right? We didn't, we didn't have this rich history, first time ever. 
we know how to put on events in this country like nobody else. Amen, that's true. Right? <laughs> Very true. Right. Final in New Jersey. Final in the great state of New Jersey. You've got to be hyped that, about right? that one, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and how, I mean, what else could we ask for in this, in this, mm. uh, I, I, I think, I'd like to think, and I said this, the night we did not make the World Cup, I said, this team is built for 2026. Because mm. I'd been with the youth national teams at that point for a while. I'm like, 2026, this is when this team will peak. And I still think, and I know there's a lot of shit that goes around the national team, and there's talk all the time about getting, I still think when we get there, uh, we'll be able to show the world that we can play. Uh, I hate to cut this short, but we do have to wrap because we've taken a bunch of your time. Uh, I, I feel like I got to know you a lot better on this show. And just a couple of things, I, I, like I have so much respect for the fact that that picture behind you is the 2002 team, because I think in your position, it would be so easy to have the picture up where you were a star, right? 1990, 1994. For you to, to say, oh, but it's the, it's the fight back. Right? That's what matters to me. I know what it costs to get back to that team. I think that says so much about your character. And whatever it is that you're protecting that hurts so much, I think that's really dope that you say, you know what, this is my choice. I'm going to keep that private. Yeah. And I have a lot of respect for that. Oh, so thank God you. bless you. Thank, thank you. you so much for coming yeah. through. Thanks, guys. I appreciate Sir. it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, bro. Right, buddy. Appreciate you. Love you, brother. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for watching. If you liked this episode of Kicking It, then don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to enjoy more raw and unfiltered content from me and the boys.